Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, uh, let us continue with our lecture series uh, on this optimal control guidance and estimation. We have just started uh, some estimation concepts uh, last time. Uh, we actually studied this LQ observer followed by some uh, overview of Kalman filter implementation and things like that. So, next couple of lectures we will go through this, uh, this derivation process of uh, Kalman filter to understand it uh, much better and then uh, talk about some issues of implementation and things like that actually. Alright, so this is uh, uh, in this particular lecture we will primarily concentrate on review of probability theory and, and random variables which, uh, which is actually needed for uh, derivation of Kalman filter later. Alright, these are some of the very basic definitions uh, of probability. There are uh, two different ways of looking at it actually. Okay. So, first definition is something like this, if there, there are n exhaustive uh, equally likely elementary events in a trial and m of them are favorable to an event A, okay, then probability of A is defined as m over n actually. Alright, so, you have uh, n exhaustive elementary events and m of them are favorable to event A, that is how the, it goes then probability of A is nothing by nothing but uh, m by n which means possible outcomes uh, favoring event A divided by total number of possible outcomes. It is very intuitive actually. Okay. So, definition 2 tells uh, something something very similar, but in a little bit different way. What tells is if a trial is conducted n times and m of them are favorable to an event A, then there is something called relative frequency R A which is defined as uh, m over n. It does not define probability directly, it tells ok because sample space is in uh, not large and all that actually. So, they tell relative frequency turns out to be m by n and in the limit where, uh, where n tends to infinity ok and if the limit exists ok, then the limit is defined as probability actually ok. So, the essentially the it tells you that uh, the number of uh, samples I mean um, should be large. Uh, then only it, you can define something like probability basically. What are sample space and events and things like that? Uh, if you think about sample space, uh, this is defined as something like uh, the set of all possible outcomes in a trial is called the sample spaces for it for the trial ok. And the elements are also called sample points actually. So, examples of tossing a coin is something like this, uh, you have this uh, something like if you toss a coin one time then uh, this is either head or tail. So, you can think of uh, head, head by the sample point and tail by the sample point. Whereas, the sample space uh, contains either all heads or all tails. So, h and t and if you take that way that the sample space. But simultaneously if you co if you toss two coins then obviously, there are four possibilities. So, either you can get h, h, uh, head, head, head and tail or tail and head or tail and tails or something like that. So, each of these combinations are nothing but sample points, whereas the total set S is, is nothing but the sample space actually. Similarly, if you toss a die, die has uh, 6 sides actually. So, here each of these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 are sample points, whereas the total collection of all the sample points, uh, if you define that as a set, that is nothing but the sample space actually. So, the event uh, is defined as something like every subset of S is, is something we called an event ok. So, if you take any subset of S ok either uh, single element, two elements, things like that or even the full set is nothing but an event actually ok. And there are something like two special events, so one is phi which is called impossible event null set actually. And then the total set I mean this the entire everything is there in that. So, the event S is called the certain event. If we, if you take the total thing, it is guaranteed to uh, have everything actually. Okay. So, for example, if you take uh, one, three, five out of this set, then this is this is an event, and suppose this you just collect heads heads and tail tail out of that, then that's an event actually. Okay. 
there are other concepts something like disjoint set, uh, I mean disjoint event, exhaustive event, complementary event, things like that. So, this is very similar or very close to set theory actually, if you uh, know that that way. So, two events A and B in a sample space S are called mutually exhaustive or disjoint events if there is nothing in common between them. That means, A intersection B is null set actually. And if the exhaustive, uh, I mean, if these two A and B are exhaustive, if uh, the union of them turns out to be the sample space, okay. So, everything is contained in that if you take union of that. And things like complementary is something uh, very interesting. If you have uh, A union B is S, but A intersection B is Y, that means uh, they complement each other very well and together they kind of uh, contain all sample space. And in between, there is nothing common in between them actually. Okay, so that that's kind of thing that you're looking for here. And there is something called complement event also. Okay, and that is defined as uh, for any event A, there is a complement event uh, A bar such that A union A bar is is S actually, and also A intersection A bar is phi. And obviously, if you take uh, complement of complement that means a double bar obviously it turns out to be a basically and some facts are something like this so you have this uh, probability of phi is obviously nothing there so it's zero probability of the sample space is one and probability of uh, a, a intersection b is, is defined as it turns out to be probability of a into probability of b and probability of a union b is summation of them provided there is nothing common in between them okay and if it turns out to be a subset of B, okay, then uh, probability of A is uh, going to be less than equal to probability of B actually. So, these are some of the results that uh, sometimes come handy in probability theory basically. Remember all of that you may not need while deriving Kalman filter, but uh, just sort of uh, kind of uh, precursor knowledge will also help us understand it slightly better. There is something called conditional probability and then con the conditional probability is not defined something like that. Like this, the probability of outcome A given an occurrence of outcome B is something uh, called as conditional probability of A given B. And this is defined as uh, probability of A given B is probability of A intersection B divided by probability of B basically. Now, there are examples and then uh, if you are really interested. You can see couple of uh, probability theory books or even uh, nice mathematics books like Rezik and all that. So, you can get lot of ideas uh, and exam including examples and all that. And using some of these concepts uh, just for information, uh, there are nice uh, advanced uh, filtering theory, uh, filtering techniques have been proposed recently. So, they are not uh, very useless that way. Uh, in other words, uh, even though they are not directly useful in Kalman filter per se. You, if you know this, then you can understand other filter techniques also better basically. Then okay, these are something like discrete events and all that. So, what we are really interested, what we are really interested in systems theory is typically uh, something that is associated with continuous signals. You know, the systems, uh, I mean, when we talk about x dot equal to some f of x u and things like that, then that is typically x of t is, uh, is a continuous variable and things like that. So, what if those things are randomly varying actually? So, in that sense, we can define something called random variable, okay. And random variable is essentially a function, okay. Remember, it is actually a function that maps all points in a sample space to real numbers, okay. And but uh, the exact value of the real number is not known actually, okay. So, the, for example, if you think about x of t, okay, there is a value, okay. So, if given a t, there is a value. But the exact value, the numerical value is uncertain actually, this is not known really, okay. So, that is called random variable actually. In other words, a variable uh, whose values are random, but whose statistical distribution is, is, is known basically, okay. Also, remember that is, uh, I mean any random variable cannot be purely random in that sense. We have to really talk about some sort of a statistical distribution associated with that. We will uh, we'll talk about that in a, in a while. So, that this is called probability density function and things like that. So, those things are known, but the value, exact value okay, that comes out in each experiment is typically unknown actually. So, in case of continuous random variables, the probability of any discrete event turns out to be 0. 
obviously because it is very intuitive to see that it is not difficult at all. Uh, suppose you have got a continuous number sense actually, let us say you, you got you are talking about the between num a number between these two. So, obviously, if you talk about real numbers, uh, there, are, there are infinite numbers in between. So, if you talk just one point out there, then obviously, the probability turns out to be 1 over infinity. So, that is not defined. So, it, uh, sorry, that is 0 because 1 over infinity turns out to be 0 actually. Okay. So, what about how to go ahead about that? So, we can talk about a probability of a single discrete event here. So, then it turns out that uh, we have to evaluate the probability of events within a finite time interval. Let us say we talk about this interval now. Okay. Now, theoretically speaking, okay, the theoretically speaking, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this, I mean, there are infinity numbers in between these two, okay, all right, and there are inf there are infinity numbers between the total, I mean, total interval also, basically. So, it turns out to be now the some uh, infinity over this interval and infinity over that interval. Okay. So, if, if you denote it as something like uh, let us say you denote it as something like a b and then it is small a small b. So, what you do is I mean this is like uh, probability turns out to be length of a b divided by length of a b probably. Okay. Then this is something like infinity over infinity and obviously, uh, there is a finite number associated with that of after that actually you can if you given a particular function like that you can use the hospital rule and then get number for that actually. But intuitively it is obvious if you if you take a some finite time interval then you can define a finite number associated with that and that turns out to be the probability of that actually. Okay. But how do you how do you define the all these uh, I mean this distribution uh, function and things like that? So there are there are concepts like uh, cumulative distribution function. Okay. The cumulative distribution function is defined as something like this. Okay, f f capital X uh, within bracket small x. Okay, that's defined as probability between the interval minus infinity to x. So it uh, it defines a uh, it represents a cumulative pro cumulative probability of the continuous random signal x actually for all events up to and including x obviously right this is uh, suppose you start from of minus infinity okay and come all the way up to x okay then whatever uh, whatever interval you are talking here uh, that that is uh, that will define what you want actually is a represents a cumulative probability of continuous random uh, variable x for all events up to and including x basically up to this. So, properties of this capital F x uh, of x, it turns out to be 0 as x goes to minus infinity. Okay. When, when x starts moving towards minus infinity, obviously, it uh, attempts it goes the the width becomes narrower and narrower ultimately it turns out to be the the pro, this uh, cumulative distribution function turns out to be zero what about x goes to plus infinity then it contains everything and hence f of x uh, goes to 1 okay so how do how does it vary actually if you if you see the okay if you want to see that the how how does it vary actually then it turns out that okay if i plot something like minus infinity to to plus infinity somewhere and i talk about some pdf value as something like 1 then it starts from infinity and then i start from zero and then go towards that actually okay so obviously f of x is a is a non discrete non decreasing function of x it keeps on uh, continuously increases i mean increasing starts with zero slowly starts building up keeps on increasing 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 and somewhere it stabilizes at 1 actually okay so that uh, that's that's the concept of distribution function cumulative distribution function now if you see an interesting property of uh, this distribution function okay that the derivative turns out to be zero here and turns out to be zero here okay so obviously derivative starts increasing and then decreasing and then it becomes again zero and all the time it kind of remains positive so you may see the slope actually okay slope is the slope is all the time is positive initially it is zero finally it is zero it's somewhere in somewhere in between it is maximum actually 
So, derivative contains a lot of information and that is how the this derivative is defined as probability density function. And this is what is uh, def I mean this is what you will come across uh, in lot of probability I mean lot of this uh, random variable concepts and all that actually. So, the probability density function now is defined as derivative of probability distribution function actually so, uh, sorry cumulative distribution function. All right, so this uh, now this is defined as small f. So small f x of uh, small x is uh, d by d x of f x x actually. So what are the properties now? Obviously, integration of uh, f x from minus infinity to plus infinity is one. Okay, and obviously as I told here, it is is always a non-negative function actually. Okay. Now, what is the beauty of defining this? Okay, it turns out uh, that you can evaluate probability between a, between some segment AB once you know this actually. How to do that? Uh, so this is uh, uh, Px of AB is nothing but fx of B minus fx of A. So it's minus infinity to B, obviously by definition, and this uh, this fx is nothing but integral of. Uh, sorry, this uh, okay. The, p x of a b is f x b minus f x a which is nothing but uh, integral of minus infinity to b this one and integral of this this one actually. Okay. So, this turns out to be because see this uh, this f of x capital f of x is integral of this small f of x okay, because if you take the reverse thing actually. So then, if you if you combine that, okay, if you if you work on that actually, what happens is minus infinity to b, and change the interval. I mean, change the uh, limits. Okay, so it talks about a to minus infinity. Then it becomes positive actually. Okay, so now what you what you can see is okay, I can uh, I can think about now minus infinity plus this minus infinity goes. So I can combine these two, and it turns out to be integral a to b. And d y d x of f of x is nothing but f x actually. Okay, so while I can put it that way. Okay, so but sometimes people tell, okay, I don't have to do all that. I just take this as a definition actually. So p x of uh, p x in the interval a b is integral of f x x d x actually. So once you know this small f of x, uh, it is lot of. Uh, Information because you can simply evaluate probability directly and many other things also possible actually. Now, something uh, mean and expected way or expected value, uh, and especially if it is a discrete event, okay, it is uh, rather easy to see. You can tell, okay, mean is uh, nothing but if I take uh, n trials, okay, and the possible, possible outcomes. Or something like x1, x2 up to xn, and each of that has probabilities p1, p2, pn. Then what happens is the number of occurrence of outcome x1 is nothing but xi in general is nothing but pi out of here into n. Okay, so this uh, this xi is okay. I can I can compute this way. Okay, so the mean turns out to be something like this. Okay, this p1 of uh, p1n into probability of that uh, which is x1 itself, and then it is p1 of uh, p2 into n into, into x2. Okay, and all the way up to that. Uh, okay, up to n, and then you divide it by the total number of things actually. Okay, and n is the possible outcomes. So divide by total thing actually. Okay. So then it turns out that okay, if n cancels out everywhere, okay, then it turns out that okay, it's nothing but the summation of p i x i basically. Okay. So this is uh, rather easy to see. But then uh, what about continuous variables and all? Okay. So continuous variable uh, we is uh, is defined this way. We talk about uh, expected value now here. So expected value of x is um, integral of minus infinity to plus infinity. X, f x, uh, d x, sort of thing. Okay. And what happens is uh, for functions of random variables. Now, suppose uh, you have a random variable, but what about some sort of a function of random variable? Actually, now if you take a random variable x, which is in discrete domain, okay, it can take only discrete numbers and all that. So then you talk about a function of that. Then you talk about expected value of that. Okay. Then turns out to be like this. Okay, summation of 
summation from i to i equal 1 to n p i g of uh, x i. But if it is a continuous case that means uh, x is a continuous random variable then expected value is defined something like this actually. Yeah. And the great property of this expected value okay, is uh, it turns out that the expected value is a linear operator. Okay. So, once something is a linear operator it is it is very handy you can do many operations rather very easily actually. We will see that some of these things uh, so I mean this particular expected value and all will be heavily used in Kalman filtering also. And there we will use uh, this uh, linear operator behavior very frequently actually. Okay. So, what do you mean by uh, an operator being linear? It satisfies the principle of superposition that means uh, if you take two signals x 1 uh, plus x 2 and take expected value of that then uh, it is nothing but the expected value of x 1 plus expected value of x 2. Similarly, if you multiply uh, this random variable with uh, with some constant c, then expected value of that turns out to be c times expected value of the value it is random variable itself. So, these two will be very very useful later. Then uh, it is something called statistical moment okay. and uh, because this g is, is in general can be any function. So, we are not interested in uh, any function per se, but this is the typical function with x to the power k basically. Okay. So, when you take g of x x to the power k what happens there in that particular case. Okay. Obviously, x expected value of x to the power k by definition is g of x multiplied by p d f of that actually. So, g of x multiplied by this uh, this f x of x whatever you see here and for example, if you talk about uh, expected value of x square then you know that you have to do is integral of minus infinity plus infinity and then k is 2 here. So, x square that is what you put here and then evaluate this integral and this is typically called a second moment of the random variable. Okay. If you put x x actually not x square then it is called first moment actually. Okay. So, in general it is kth statistical moment of the continuous random variable x that is how it is defined actually. Now, why it is useful uh, the second uh, moment and things like that because uh, this uh, variation concepts actually. Okay. So, anytime you talk about a signal that is randomly varying there are two things that is uh, very critical one is uh, what is the mean value about which the very I mean very variation or, or deviation happens actually. And then after the mean value what is the spread of the variable and uh, spread of the values actually okay. Now, that spread of the values is given by the second moment and that is typically called variation and square root of that will turn out to be standard deviation actually. Okay. So, what is variance? Variance is okay. what is the expect random signal minus the expected value that means mean value sort of thing. So, you have some some randomly variable uh, some randomly varying signal okay, so random variable x all that you are telling is okay, seeing the difference between uh, the value from its mean value basically and then taking that as a function there g of x. Okay. So, then if you if you do that okay, then you operate in the second moment and things like that actually. Okay then you operate we get this uh, this sigma x square. In other words, sigma x square is nothing but this particular deviation value what you get there whole square actually. Now, essentially this is a number finally, the value is not known, but it is a number okay. and this is also a number, it is a expected value is a deterministic mean value sort of thing, it is a number. So, when you have this uh, this sort of uh, operation going on a square, you can actually use this uh, a minus v whole square formula. Then it turns out to be something like x square minus uh, 2x expected value of x plus e to the power a mean expected value of x whole square basically. Okay. But remember expected value of x is nothing but mu of x that is by definition actually. Okay. So, what happens this? This is nothing but mu x square by definition this, this is mu x and that is mu x square. But expected value of x square we do not know I mean we, we have to just keep it actually. Okay, so, but remember now it is uh, we will use this uh, uh, linear property of the expected value uh, operator. So, expected operator is a linear operator. So, then what happens we can uh, we can expand this bracket and then tell okay this is nothing but expected value of x square minus okay all the way the expected value can go I mean this is nothing but mu x mu about mu x is a number remember that. So, 2 mu x will come out 
then expected value of x will come here ok. Then it is nothing but mu x square ok. But what is expected value of x again it is nothing but mu x. So, this turns out to be 2 mu x square and this is plus mu x square. So, it ultimately it turns out to be minus mu x square. So, sigma x square in general is expected value of x square minus mu x whole square actually uh, minus mu x square ok. So, uh, this is a nice property because uh, you do not have to do this all the time you can just see uh, expected value of x square minus mu x square actually. All right, then by definition, the standard deviation is nothing but variance of x. Uh, sorry, square root of the variance of x. So, sigma x is nothing but square root of sigma x square. That's what the definition tells actually here. Okay. And typically, it's a positive square root actually. Okay. So the point here is this mean and variance, okay, or rather standard deviation and all that. A very useful statistical properties of any random signal. So, somebody tells it is a random signal, so you cannot tell where the number will lie, but if you carry a lot of experiment, uh, we will be typically knowing what is the average value and uh, what uh, what is the standard deviation or variance actually. Okay. And in fact, the, the entire Kalman filter turns out to be a, a, I mean kind of take making kind of a track record between the, this mu expected value and variance actually or other covariance what you will call there actually okay, because it turns out to be a vector signal then you do is see what you are talking here is scalar variables and all but when it turns out to be a vector of random variables actually then you talk about something called covariance okay and then uh, the entire filtering filtering theory is expected value and covariance matrix that is so that is what it will talk about actually we will see that as we go along. Then this this particular distribution uh, is of very importance in uh, in any probability theory, including Kalman filtering. And the reasons for this this uh, popularity of Gaussian distribution is three things. First thing is it's close to the nature. Okay, that means by default many of the distribution turns out to be Gaussian actually. But on top of that, there is a central limit theorem as well, that which tells us that sum of random variables with any distribution can start with any distribution, but if you keep on adding them up ok. So, sum of random variables with any distribution ultimately tends towards normal distribution ok. So, that is why this normal distribution or, or Gaussian distribution is very popular actually. Yeah. But that is not the only that is not the thing it is uh, what is also good about it is it is mathematically uh, tractable and attractive actually okay. that means you can do lot of uh, algebra very easily actually. And what is the probability density function associated with that? This is something like this. Okay. It is characterized by mu and sigma square, okay. and this uh, probability density function okay, turns out to be like something like this: okay. one over uh, square root of two pi sigma square exponential minus half. This, this thing, actually. where x varies from minus infinity plus infinity. You take any value of x, the density function will give you a number actually. How does it how does it look like? Uh, well, if you plot it something like this, uh, okay. If uh, if sigma is small, it will turn out to be something like this, okay. And if sigma is large, then it's a large distribution. I mean, it will turn out to be like this actually. Okay. So what happens here is uh, it depends on uh, see mu remains same probably both the both the plots, but if sigma is small. It is every mo most of the values are centered around mu basically. So, but if sigma is large, th then many of the numbers are, are deviated away from mu basically. That is what it tells you. Okay. But area under the curve probably will remain same because ultimately, if you take minus infinity plus infinity integration, okay, both of that will give us 1 actually. Okay. All right. So, if you take a cumulative density function. Okay, this one what we discussed here. Sorry, cumulative distribution function. Okay. Okay, cumulative distribution function is if something like this. So ultimately, probability between this interval a and b will turn out to be like this. And this very interesting property of that. Most of the time, it it is is useful from two sigma onwards especially. And if you take uh, something like uh, 
okay minus sigma to plus sigma in other words you have got a sigma value here okay. okay typically by this actually it turns out to be something like 3 sigma value okay so this one is the 2 sigma this one is sigma and similarly this is sigma this is 2 sigma let's say okay. so if i take this one this one okay okay and then talk about probability between this interval okay that is minus sigma and uh, well mu minus sigma to be exact and this is mu plus sigma okay if i take the probability between this interval it turns out to be 68 percent if that means if i take the area under this okay and divide it by divide it by the total area it turns out to be 68 percent okay and then if i talk 2 sigma that means uh, between this interval now okay it is much better it is 95 percent 95.5 percent already if i take 3 sigma it is 99.73 okay and for all, all practical purpose we typically stop at 3 3 sigma value okay, plus or minus 3 sigma value but what is good remember if you uh, suppose you are estimating something okay you do not know actually what is the value but you are estimating something you got this value mu okay and you tell okay all my signals are bounded by, I mean, very close to the mu that means uh, this is how it is okay sorry the ideally okay this will not be like that okay uh, it tells okay my my sigma is small actually okay so that is typically very close to that so most of the values will fall close to sigma really uh, close to mu okay then it is a good estimator actually okay and I have lot of confidence in something with uh, with uh, where sigma is small. So, if any sensor that you are using and then uh, doing some experiment uh, to characterize whether the sensor is good or bad, you should not only see the mu, you should also see you should also see what is the value of sigma associated with mu. If, uh, if sigma is small, then uh, the confidence on that value on that average value mu is, uh, is much higher actually. Okay, but but somebody tells us only mu and then remain silent on about sigma is not not good also, because if you carry out let's say, I mean just to be simple two experiments and uh, probably one value is uh, minus 0.01 and other value is plus 0.01, then uh, the average value is zero, and uh, another two numbers where the one is minus thousand and other one is uh, plus thousand, the mean is still zero. So, just talk about mean value does not give us the complete picture, it always has the, the variation associated with the mean value that gives us the complete picture actually. Okay. All right, so these are the Gaussian distribution and why it is uh, okay, mathematically tractable, let us see actually. Okay, there are properties of normal distribution, something turns out to be like that. If I construct another random variable. Okay, as a linear combination of this, uh, as a linear function of this original random variable, something like y equal to x plus b, then I can directly write the PDF of y basically. Okay, so PDF of y, which turns out that it will, it will, the average value mu turns out to be mu plus b, okay, and so the variance turns out to be sigma square. Okay, sorry, a sigma sort of thing. Okay. If you see, if you compare this, okay, the variance turns out to be a sigma. Uh, well, the s square sigma square, but the sigma square is the original variance. So the variance of uh, y turns out to be a square sigma square, and uh, average, I mean, that mu, the is the original mean value for uh, or expected value for x, and uh, the expected value for y will be exactly same linear function of mu. That means, if I know y is x plus b, I can directly write what is the I mean mu of y something like this and uh, sigma of y will turn out to be a sigma basically. Okay, that is one thing. Other thing is if I take let us say x 1 and x 2 are two independent random variables. Okay, with characteristics being these things, that means uh, x1 has uh, mean value mu1 and then sig variance sigma 1 square. Similarly, x2 has mean value mu2 and variance sigma 1 2 square. Okay, then x1 plus x2 will satisfy this. That means its mean value will become mu1 plus mu2, and its variance will become sigma 1 square plus sigma 1 2 square. Okay. 
all right. Then the PDF becomes something like this f x of x 1 plus x 2 turns out to be something like this actually. Okay. So, it is easy I mean if you if you know that it is a normal distribution then many things can be done just by looking at some of these nice properties actually. Okay. Then there is some concept called conditional probability and things like that. Okay. So, you have this uh, two continuous random variables x and y are statistically independent. Okay. If their joint PDF okay, something called joint PDF now f x uh, of x y is equal to the product of their individual PDFs. That means, if I talk about f x y of x y then turns out to be multiplication of both actually. And this is this is what I was talking a little bit a little while before this base rule or Bayesian probability and things like that this is based on which people have uh, proposed very neat uh, filtering ideas actually. A very recent literature if you see the things are available Bayesian based uh, belief. Uh, for filtering theory basically. Yeah. So, it talks about con conditional probability okay. and first thing is continuous continuous that means, uh, p d f of a continuous uh, random variable x given the presence of a continuous random variable y so is defined something like this and that expression turns out to be like this. Yeah. Similarly, but if it is continuous discrete that means, p d f of discrete x given the presence of continuous y okay, turns out to be something like this little more complex actually. Okay, here is a neat concept uh, which will need very quickly okay, this uh, concept of uh, something called auto correlation. Now, random remember x, x is a time varying function I mean time varying uh, random signal. So, x of t 1 and x of t 2 will be different actually. Okay. So, what about uh, expected value of x of t 1 into x of t 2? Okay. Okay. So, if you take t 1, t 2 are two simple times, then you construct the x of t 1 into x of t 2 and then take expected value of that, what will turn out to be and whatever it turns out that is defined as auto correlation actually. Okay. And the theorem tells us that if the process is stationary, okay, so that means by definition the p d f is invariant with time, p d f does not change actually. Then this autocorrelation okay, R x of t 1 t 2 is just a function between t 1 minus t 2. Okay. This is just a function of t 1 minus t 2 basically. Okay. So, R x of t 2 minus t 1 okay, R x of t 1 t 2 is nothing but R x of t 2 minus t 1 the interval between them okay, that, this tau. Basically. So, I can always uh, write it as a function of tau instead of writing t 1, t 2 and all. So, this uh, R x of tau then is expected value of uh, x of t into remember uh, t 1 is t and t 2 is t plus tau basically. So, this is how it is. Now, this is a nice property this R x gives us many interesting things actually. Now, let us see some, some things like this. Now, we have let us say two signals x 1 and x 2. Now, we want to see which is more correlated with respect to itself actually autocorrelation tells us that actually. Okay. If you see x 2 and x 1, x 1 turns out to be short, but it is wide actually. Okay. So, if I take a value t 1 here, okay, let us say I, I put a t value, value t 1 here and something like t 2 here. Then there is if I take x 1 then there is uh, something which is non 0 okay, and here is something which is non 0 that means the multiplication of that uh, will not turn out to be 0 basically. Okay. But what about uh, x 2 if I take that one okay, well this is a there is a value here but there is uh, nothing there that is 0 basically okay. all right. So, that means uh, x 2 signal is less correlated to itself basically because if I if I take a difference between t 1 and t 2 higher okay, then it is quickly going towards 0 actually. But if it is uh, distribute I mean if it is uh, wide okay, the I mean autocorrelation function turns out to be wider then it turns I mean uh, it is uh, something like more correlated to itself actually. Okay. So, this is this means okay, this picture tells us that uh, x 2 is less correlated with itself than uh, than x 1 actually. Okay. 
x 1 is more correlated to itself, because if I even if the difference between t 1 t 2 becomes wider and wider, the numbers do not go to 0 very quickly basically, because uh, uh, this I mean this will still turn out some number positive number is non 0 basically, that is the reason. Now, what is the limit in case in the if that is the case. Now, let us say this width turns out to be smaller and smaller and smaller ultimately the width uh, turns out to be 0, then what actually. That means, if I talk about the same time instant, okay, then I will get some value for uh, this so x of t 1 and 2 x of t 1 has some value, but the moment x of t 2 uh, t 2 is slightly different from x 1. Okay, that means, uh, t 2 is something like t 1 plus delta t, where delta t is a very small value actually then this number is not there that means one of that is zero okay and hence everything is turns out to be zero actually so in that particular case this something defined like this and that is nothing but white noise okay might have heard about this uh, this white noise many times and all that actually or maybe we'll see that uh, in our common uh, filtering derivation also basically so all that it tells us uh, for a stress uh, first of all the the signal has to be stationary the pdf should not change and then it turns out that okay, r of r x of tau is nothing but just the direct delta function basically. Okay, so that means if it if, if tau is zero, there is no interval between between two numbers t one t two. Then it turns out to be some finite value a. Otherwise, it's zero basically. Okay. So note that color white noise is a very important uh, building block. Okay, for random signal processing and including Kalman filter. Okay, and standard uh, way of handling colored noise is to construct the colored noise as output of another system with white noise being its input and augmenting the system with the total system. For example, if you have this, uh, let us say, okay, let me give an example here. Let us say you have this x dot equal to x plus uh, something like w, but w is not white now, then what do you do? Okay. So, what you tell is okay, I will uh, put construct another some some sort of a transfer function or some function here whatever it is, then where I will give uh, something like w 1, I will give w actually, but this is a dynamic system remember that. So, maybe something like a first order system or second order it depends on all that the noise behavior basically, but then what you will do is suppose it is a first order then you put a w dot equation okay, and then tell okay, it is something like. Uh, well, if you see this expression, it turns out to be what actually w by w output by input is just a by s plus a. Okay, so something like w dot plus a w is equal to a w one actually. So if you tell w dot is nothing but minus a w plus a w one. Okay, now w has become a state actually. If you see this this thing, it's not a random noise anymore. This has become a state, but this one happens to be random signal again. But this then then the modeling has to be done in such a way that W one turns out to be white actually. Okay, so that means again you come back to the entire. If you see the visualize the entire system, okay, W one has become the noise actually. Okay, now W one is is white. Actually. Okay, so this concept is called uh, sapping filter, and typically this is not a very simple thing to get this transfer function what you are talking here. But for uh, for important uh, phenomenon, uh, these things are available as part of the modeling uh, process, basically. Okay, so for example, if you talk about uh, let's say wind gust and all that, uh, there are Dryden models and things like that way. So which will do this exactly like this. The Dryden model is all that it, all that it tells is if I take a white noise and put it in the in that the output of that uh, function what I'm having will give me the that particular noise which is physically happening basically that is called color noise. If something is non white it is called color noise actually. So, input will be white, but output will be colored and then I can augment the, the original system that way, uh, where the input is still a white noise and hence I can use color filter actually. We will see an example in a subsequent class also basically that way. Now, the same thing can be interpreted in, uh, in different ways also. Now, if you talk about time domain, and this r x of r x of tau is can be represented something like this exactly at 0 it is some value and that is not and in a, a anything uh, like this can also have some frequency domain interpretation as long as the process is stationary. So, you, you construct this uh, this Fourier transform sort of thing can, then uh, this is defined something like this and it turns out to be just a constant number okay, irrespective of omega I mean 
if you plot it as a function of omega, it turns out to be just constant. That means, it contains all frequency spectrum actually. Okay, so, there is another interpretation in the frequency domain basically. Then there are concepts uh, like something like cross correlation and cross covariance things like that. Okay, so, first thing is cross correlation. Suppose, the, here we are talking auto correlation, we talked about the same signal. Okay x and x, but suppose the signal is different, we have something like x and y, then what actually? Okay. In that case, it is now no more an autocorrelation, but it is something like cross correlation okay. and it is very similar to that, but the fact is it is not x, y here actually. Okay. And again, cross correlation uh, function is also only a function of tau, that means, uh, it does not depend on, it is not really a function of t, but it is function of tau really, the difference between T2 and T1 sort of thing for any stationary random process. Okay. And if you have cross correlation, you also have cross covariance. Okay. So, the cross covariance is defined something like the expected value of uh, x minus mu x in multiplied with y as a function of t plus tau minus mu y actually. Okay. Then uh, something called stationary stochastic processes and all. So, tell okay, when is this? Uh, when the stationary processes x and y are, are uncorrelated or when they are correlated like that actually. So, they are uncorrelated if this cross cove, I mean this this function that we just talked about cross correlation function okay, okay, turns out to be just multiplication of this expected values of the two. Okay. So, if you talk about uh, right uh, this um, uh, stochastic process x and y and if somebody tells oh these are not correlated, these are uncorrelated, then this this operation, I mean this result can be used actually. And in fact, we will see in uh, Kalman filter derivation, many times we will use this actually, okay, because process noise to sensor noise is uncorrelated and uh, initial condition uh, to something like pro sensor noise is uncorrelated like that actually, you will see many things uh, getting used there. So, you can define it this way or equivalently you can define something on the in terms of cross covariance of the okay. instead of uh, cross correlation which is expected value of these two I mean, multiplications only, you talk about the deviation of that from their, from their own mean values and then take uh, multiplication of that and that turns out to be cross covariance. So, the cross covariance matrix okay, uh, of that is can be written like this. And then if you keep, then if you see, this is nothing but uh, this expected value of this into expected value of that, right? Because these are uh, not correlated. Right? We just talked about something somewhere actually. Okay. Well, maybe somewhere is there. Okay. okay. So if you if you see this expected value of this, these two. Okay, so these these are uncorrelated. So then, expected value I can talk about that multiplication of these two. Then I can use this uh, uh, expected value as a linear operator. So I can take it inside. Okay, then mu of x is I mean expected value of x of t is mu of x, and expected value of mu of x. Mu of x is a number, constant number. So any constant number and the average or expected value of that is the same constant number. So I put it that way. Then expected value of that is again by definition mu of y minus mu of y. Okay, so it turns out to be zero basically. Okay. And this property will be again we will use it actually. Okay. And there is another definition called orthogonality. And random variables x and y are said to be orthogonal if this uh, r x y of tau turns out to be zero basically. Okay, if I multiply these two. Turns out to be zero. Then these signals are called uh, orthogonal actually. All these are in the in the form of uh, so I mean scalars. Then what happens in form of vectors actually? Okay. So when you have a vector v, which is which has n components, okay, but each of the component are uh, something like stochastic processes actually. Scalar components, stochastic processes. Then what actually? Then the mean value by definition is nothing but the mean values of everything, these are bunch of definitions actually. Autocorrelation matrix, okay, now it is V V transpose okay. and these are some, something like outer products actually, remember that. Okay. V is, let us say you have n, n by 1 matrix okay. 
but so this is n by 1 then then v transpose okay this is uh, n by 1 okay and so obviously v transpose will be 1 by n so the total thing will be n by n that means uh, it's actually a matrix okay similarly auto covariance matrix is can be defined something like this again these are typically outer products all the time okay not inner products actually but also remember if you have uh, some outer product uh, well if you have some v well, let me see that okay if you have some outer product something like v v transpose and if you really want to get inner product v transpose v then it turns out that is nothing but trace of this actually so when you do outer product uh, okay this, okay it contains uh, inner product information as well in it. You just, just take the diagonal uh, elements and sum it up that will turn out to be the inner product actually okay. so the covariance at, uh, i mean auto correlation matrix uh, auto covariance matrix now and similarly the variation uh, variance matrix uh, something like this and these are something we will call about covariance matrix actually in common filtering okay so we talk about signal minus the average value that is the deviation from the mean value and then operate it again with respect to itself which is in the sense of an outer product actually okay. then we will get that all right so this is uh, some sort of a little bit overview of probability theory uh, and uh, stochastic processes and, uh, and some definitions associated with that and all that so before stopping this lecture again uh, whatever we discussed in the last lecture let me let us revisit a little bit what you are interested in in this particular lecture series is the gearing of towards this uh, this continue this Kalman filter in general okay and then uh, looking back uh, what we discussed uh, last lecture we discussed something like continuous time Kalman filter followed by e cap okay so e cap let's not recapitulate but let's see how systematically the Kalman filter uh, in the linear domain can be derived and all that that we'll do in the next class but uh, but uh, as a summary sort of thing this is what it is the Kalman filter uh, what we require the information and what is the task. So, information required is uh, something like a system model uh, we need a linear model per se okay if it is, if it is not linear it, uh, it needs to be linearized first and then we need some uh, some measurements and the statistical behaviors okay and we also need statistical models characterizing the process and measurement noise and typically we will assume that they are zero mean uncorrelated white noise and typically now it should mean what do you mean by zero mean what do you mean by uncorrelated signal and what do you mean by white noise it should all uh, make sense now basically yeah. then uh, also we will need initial condition information for, for the states actually okay. so what is the task task is to estimate or filter the state uh, by processing the measurement data and using the system model actually okay. so how do you do that uh, very quickly let us see that we have x dot equal to x plus v plus g w now okay where w is just something like a process white noise a process noise which is white okay for example wind gust on model high frequency dynamics and things like that and you have this measurement y which is nothing but c x plus v okay and this v is a measurement noise basically okay. you have process noise and you have measurement noise so assumption is these these noises are zero mean white noise now again it will uh, it should make sense now what is uh, white noise and all that okay autocorrelation function turns out to be direct delta function actually and uh, x of uh, zero is unknown initial condition is typically uh, not uh, not known really but it is characterized by some sort of something like a mean value and its covariance actually okay how what, how much it is distributed away from the mean value okay. and w of t v of t as it told it are zero mean white noise and zero mean means first mu's are zero okay and the kind of covariance is nothing but uh, for w it is q and for v it is r actually all right so kalman filter talks about something like this you have got a estimator or something like a um, observer dynamics actually and it is very close to what we know the system dynamics here x plus v u plus z w obviously this these quantities z w and v cannot be processed okay because they are they are noisy quantities and things like that they are directly used for some processing only in the particle filtering by the way everywhere else these are concepts they are not used in computation per se 
So, anyway, so coming back, this is what it is, this is estimator uh, dynamics really. So, it got Ax hat plus Vu plus Ke times Y minus Y hat, where Y hat is nothing but expected value of Cx plus V, okay, that is the mm, that is nothing but Y basically. Okay. I mean, this uh, by definition, okay, Y hat is expected value of this. Okay. So, then expected value is a linear operator again. So, we can expand this okay, and then expected value of E is 0 because it is a 0 mean noise and C can come out and it turns out to be something like this. Okay. So, Y8 is nothing but C X8. Okay, so, that is something like a expected output sort of thing. I mean, this is a true output and this is expected output basically. So, there is a difference between them. And that is how it is this observer dynamics or estimator dynamics is operates basically. So, Kalman filter also defines something like covariance matrix and covariance matrix uh, turns out to be definition by definition is expected value of x tilde times x tilde transpose, where x tilde is x, my x of t minus x height of t. Okay, this is remember this is two true states and this is estimated state. The difference between that is x tilde basically. So, P of t is a measure of uncertainty in the say in the system in the estimate uh, that is why we are more interested in P also basically. We estimate something, but we also want to know a measure of uncertainty in that particular estimate that is why P of t is important actually. And if the observer dynamics is asymptotically stable ok it turns out to be like that and W of, w of t V of t are stationary processes obviously, the, the, the error will eventually reach a steady state value ok. And uh, the idea here is to uh, need to design this KE, remember this needs still is not sure what is KE, we need to still design that. So, the gain KE is chosen so that it minimizes steady state error covariance matrix, ok. And then the optimal gain will be something like a constant matrix, we will see that in the next class we will derive all that actually. So, in implementation sense, we have got some initial condition, uh, initial condition, expected initial condition rather, starting from there. We can compute the Kalman gain, okay, where this P is nothing but for uh, the positive definite matrix, but it is also this filter Riccardi matrix solution sort of thing. So, the Riccardi matrix, uh, filter Riccardi matrix is something like this, it needs to be solved for P, and once you get for P, this Ke is ready actually. Okay. So, finally, if Ke is ready, then estimator or filter dynamics is done that way. So, starting with this initial condition, you can propagate it based on the actual measurements actually. Yeah. That is it. So, thanks for attention and then we will continue the derivation in the uh, in the next class actually. Thank you. Bye.